Well, the UK is on track for an election this summer. As it currently stands, the nation could be in for a political shakeup as it battles some big economic issues that we're dealing with in this country, high interest rates, low growth, a significant productivity challenge, so certainly some parallels to the Canadian story, and more broadly, a changing political mood across Canada and the U.S. Of course, there's an American election that's set to take center stage later this year. We'll see what happens with the Canadian election story, but let's get some insight and analysis on the U.K. story from David Oliver, public affairs strategist and founder of Minerva Strategy. Good to see you, David. And Thanks. Uh, you know, uh, is that a fair characterization, kind of similar parallels to what we're dealing with here in North America right now? Very much. So. I think he was, I think there was a lot of uh, surprise, actually, that the election was called, not least in his own parliamentary party. I think there was a lot of shock last week when he suddenly rolled out the front of uh, number 10 and got drenched making that announcement. Um, and actually, that's that really has been the story of the start of the campaign. It's been a bit of a hapless start by the Conservatives and by Rishi Sunak. He's had a, quite a few gaffes. Um, you're not going to get very good odds. I don't make election predictions, but you're not going to get very great odds down at your favourite sh uh, betting shop on a, on a Conservative victory. It, you know, looks like a, a Labour victory, but it's uh, it, not surprising that we finally got the election. It was going to happen this year. It was surprising that it, it, it came in July. And so, you know, if we're going to make a comparison to Canada where maybe people <clears> are having <throat> fatigue with the Trudeau government, uh, the fact that we've had Quite a few conservative governments at this point. Maybe there's just fatigue over that. 14 years of a conservative government. Uh, 14 years of a conservative government with many different prime ministers. Though right. obviously, you know, Cameron was was prime minister for a long period of time, and then we've had the huge period of turbulence that has coincided since the uh, since the Brexit vote. Uh, inevitably, people are, are, are you know get uh, get bored of the government they've got. But there's a lot of problems in the UK, and I think the big challenge is for any incoming government in, in, incoming government which is likely to be a Labour one. It's not a great situation that they're inheriting. You know, it's interesting because I, I saw some uh, <clears throat> uh, reporting over the weekend of the United States around how uh, U.S. President Joe Biden describes the American economy and that even if there's a lot of people who are gainfully employed right now, people don't necessarily feel it in their pocketbook. And Bloomberg had a piece specifically on the U.K. noting that over the course of this parliament, household income has declined Notably, yeah. but then when they do some survey work on how households in the UK feel, it was something like 8% poorer than their European peers in 2007. Then the gap by, call it 2022, had widened to 20%. So that obviously would predate uh, whatever uh, Rishi Sunak had to get out there and talk about on the economic front. But but how important is that issue of how people feel about their wealth when it comes to who they vote for? Hugely. Um, and the standard of living in, in the UK has felt for many people that it's been in decline for a long period of time. Uh, GDP per capita has declined, although you could argue a lot of that's down to uh, immigration. But even so, and similar to Canada, even so, um, it's been at best flat, if not for many people, because of the huge amounts of inflation. And that's been the story of the last couple of years. Massive energy bills. People feel a huge amount poorer in the UK. And so at the end of the day, uh, for the prime minister to call this general election, uh, even if... Um on the surface, things don't look all that promising. Why go ahead and do that? Well, I, I, and this is why everybody was surprised. The one thing that happened on the day that he announced the election is the UK have got back to 2.3% uh, on inflation. So that's the best inflation figures they've had in three years. Um, that was the only thing, if you wanted to point to anything that was logical to call the election now, that was the only bit that was logical, this idea that things probably aren't going to get much better. There could be an interest rate cut within the next six weeks because inflation has come down that much. But there's really not much else. And other than he was going to have to call an election at any point, at some point before the end of the year, people still expect it to be awesome rather than now. And what would you say uh, Canada has to think about in terms of how this all might play out? I think there's been a lot of focus on how, uh, I mean, look, the prime minister, our prime minister, uh, was just in Philadelphia, um, you know, almost, almost putting himself into the American presidential campaign trail. It almost felt that way, sort of positioning for what the tone out of Canada will look like going into the fall. But what about Canada's relationship with the UK, especially now that we have a summer election uh, in Great Britain? Yeah, I think I think a, a, an incoming Prime Minister of Keir Starmer is probably somebody who's going to be more politically uh, attuned to to a, to a Justin Trudeau. Um, so, you know, I don't I think, if anything, that will probably improve relationships. 
Um, I think Canada and the UK have obviously historically always had very strong relationships. I think that the challenge for Canada, as with the UK, and we've just had the wrap-up, I think, of this G7 finance ministers, is countries like Canada and the UK are very constrained in what they can do. There's not much money. They can't spend their way into growth. There is no growth. And they've got a very difficult circle to square in terms of trying to find out where that's going to come from at the moment. The US can do different things. It's the global reserve currency. The US can do things other countries can't. Canada and the UK? They can't do those things. And it would feel to me, you, you <clears throat> tell me uh, how, how you feel about it, like there's more parallels in the housing market of Canada and the UK yeah. than there are in the Canadian and American stories. Because you, you have this, those same, same affordability issues. Usually. Um, and, and, and supply constraints, yeah. it would seem, that yeah. the UK is grappling with, that Canada is grappling with. And it seems almost odd when you compare geographically the size of the UK with Canada, but the reality is the UK is a much smaller, obviously, geographically, but huge at the southeast of England, but also the other cities are massively overpopulated. Huge amounts of immigration coming in. Same story in Canada. And now we've got high interest rates, and that's going to be a really interesting thing to watch, I think, over the next year to two years as people are come off, you know, finally coming off those those really good rates they got during the pandemic. We're still waiting to see what implication that has in the economies in both the UK and Canada. And it, it doesn't feel like it's washed through yet. I, yeah. You know, we still got to see what happens with that. Yeah.